Hey everybody out there, my name is Dragnix, and this is Overwatch Friday. This is where I discuss issues in the gaming and tech world, and talk about them while putting some Overwatch footage in the background. Cause I gotta use that footage somehow, you know? But before I begin, I have a giveaway from last time to take care of. And the winner of that giveaway is on the screen right about now. I thank everybody for entering, and for the person who won, Usually I would say for them to contact me via the Steam information in the description below. But no one ever seems to do that. And then I forget that I have to give a game away. And you know, that's just a whole mess in and of itself. So I'm just going to contact you. How about that? As for the game for this week, it's on the screen right about now. Usually I try to figure out exactly what game to give away. Basically right before I finish editing this video. How do you answer? Well, you have to do two things. First, you have to be subscribed to this channel. Of course you do. But secondly, you have to answer this question in the comments section below. The question for this week is simple. What game company do you believe has the best quality control? And that is the discussion for this week, in particular, talking about Blizzard. But before I begin, I do have one other disclosure to get out of the way. I did apply to a QA position at Blizzard two months ago, and I failed at the second round of interviews. Now, do I think it was justified in terms of the interview process? Yeah, I don't necessarily interview well, and one of the questions that they gave me, I took a little bit longer than I probably should have because I wanted to do it in the way that they wanted me to do it as opposed to the way that I knew how to do it. I tell you that because of possible biases. Now, do I think it's affecting my opinion on the situation? I don't think so. I think I've disconnected myself away from the situation enough. But hey, sometimes we can't see these things. And you should know that so you can make your own decision about what I'm talking about. Okay, so why talk about Blizzard QA? Well, recently they just finished up their Overwatch Uprising event. There was a nice little PvE section in terms of being able to fight a bunch of bots, along with new skins and a little bit more lore added to the actual game, which is always nice to see. Now the skins were nice and the PvE mode was nice as well, but if you noticed on Twitter, I was a little bit critical of the event, in particular for one big reason, May. For those who don't know, at the start of the Uprising event, there were a bunch of other changes made to the game. There were changes made to Lucio and his main base set of skills, as well as some other cosmetic and animation changes. In May's case, the only thing that was supposedly changed was an animation on her pinky finger. But that really, really wasn't the case. May was broken. And Genji was broken a little bit too, but not to the extent that May was. This will be the center of the discussion that I'm going to have today. This is going to be talking about bugs, the release process, and in particular, severity of bugs. Now, when I talk about the severity of a bug, I am referring to the level in which the bug impacts the main product of the system. Now, there's a lot of different ways to measure severity, but for the sake of this example, we will use a simple 1 to 5 scale. This is based off one of my old jobs, aka working at GFI Genfair. Now, a severity of 5, for example, is something that would be nice to fix, like something like cosmetic, for example, where yes, it is broken, yes, there is something to fix here, but when it comes to the overall customer experience, when it comes to the person who is actually working with the system, they can get around it, there are other ways to deal with it, and the main functionality is not touched. In the Overwatch example, the level 5 severity would be something like, let's say, May's pinky finger animation, as I mentioned before. May's pinky finger not working the way it's supposed to, yeah, it's a little bit strange and it's going to look odd, but when it comes to the main feature set of the game, the actual gameplay in question, it's not that important. Some people will notice it, but it's more important that you actually get the gameplay right rather than focus on that pinky finger. A level 3 severity would be something that either affects a subset of users or in particular is an issue that yeah, there's a problem here, but you do have ways of getting around it or it doesn't necessarily hinder the system to a horrible, horrible extent. A good example of a level 3 severity bug, at least in my mind, 
was the original problem that happened on the original Overwatch Uprising release with Genji. What happened with Genji was there were some unintentional changes in the system that reduced the amount of swings that he could get in his Dragon Blade Ultimate from 6 down to 5. Now, not a lot of people noticed this at first, and only real Genji players, aka Genji mains, really noticed this right away. Now, you may say to yourself, Dragnix, that is gameplay affecting. This could really hurt the competitive scene. This could really hurt any Genji main. This should be a level 1 severity. And I would disagree with you on that. Now, severity can be measured in a couple of different ways, but two of the most common ones are the frequency and how much it actually affects the system in question. Now, for the effect on the system, going from 6 swings to 5, yeah, you may miss a kill, but will it necessarily change the overall picture of a match? No, not really. Sure, at maybe higher levels where the difference between competition is very, very small, but for the major part of the game, no, it's not going to affect people that much. In addition, the amount of situations you're able to use all six swings is actually rather low, well, compared to the other four, five, or three swings that you may see from Genji. That has to do with enemy placement, being able to dash at the right point, and honestly, there's just not a lot of situations that I see where you're going to get all six swings in, at least in the common case. Now, of course, as a developer, you never want to see any bugs in your system. And the fact is, you want to fix it right away. But you want to fix it right away without causing any other issues for your system. And in the case of Genji's Dragon Blade, the fact of going from 6 to 5, pushing out an update on the day of release, yeah, is probably not a good idea. But let's move on to May. Now, for those of you who don't play Overwatch, Mei is a defensive hero that has a very special weapon, an endothermic blaster. What's an endothermic blaster, you may ask? Well, consider a flamethrower, but instead of flames, ice. Now, this ice thrower, aka this endothermic blaster, does have some properties to it. If you hit a stream of ice on an opponent long enough, they will freeze, which is very, very important because then you can use your right click to make an icicle to shoot them in the head. But there's one other ability that's important to that. The main property of the endothermic blaster in question is the ability to slow down an enemy caught in its fire. So it's easier to hit and freeze an enemy if you're slowing them down. So if you keep the stream on them, they slow, they slow, they slow, they freeze. This is the main mechanic of Mei and why she's able to be so effective with the icicles and able to do headshots. Because, well, the enemy is frozen at that point or slowed. She is a very good defensive hero. And while, yes, I know that some people really hate her character design, I really do think it adds a lot of strategy to the game. Now you may be saying to yourself, Dragnix, that's great and all, but what was broken in this update that you have a problem with? Well, what was broken was the slowdown effect. You could still freeze an enemy if you were able to keep up with them, but part of the balance of May is the ability to slow down an enemy, and that was completely gone. Where my issue with Blizzard's quality control and the quality process lies is the issue of how severe this broken issue was. Now, in my mind, this is a level one severity. This is a system breaker. This is the type of issue in which you say, hold on a second, we just broke something majorly. Let's put a lot of our effort into fixing that issue because certain people are not going to be able to play the game at all because of the changes we made. Hell, in a lot of cases, a level 1 severity issue should be something that you roll back the software on. Yes, you made a mistake, you weren't able to see it in QA or anything like that, and thus, we probably should push back the software because it will affect the overall product quality. But in the case of an uprising event and something that you advertised, Blizzard's sort of in a hard place here. The fact is, if they roll back the changes, no one's going to be able to play the new stuff so they had to make a decision. This is where my main problem comes in terms of what the severity of May's inability to freeze was. In my mind, that's a level one issue, but in Blizzard's mind, it wasn't. In fact, it was probably closer to a level three issue. 
The reason why I believe it's a level three issue, at least in the minds of Blizzard, was the discussion on the forums talking to the development team and Jeff Kaplan about the May issue in question. They were able to identify what the issue was within a day, but they didn't release the fix to it until a week later. Now, from my perspective, that means they're probably going through their regular release process and testing, aka they're not specializing for a situation where they need to get a release out right now because of a level one severity. They're taking their time, they're putting other changes in, and they'll get to it with the next release. It's still important, just not important like, let's say, crashes of the client. But that's where I completely disagree. The thing is, is that Overwatch is a very, very delicately balanced game. There are a lot of heroes. There are a lot of ways to counterpick. There's a lot of different ways to play. But the thing is, is that when one hero is broken, it changes the entire meta of the actual game. For example, dealing with an enemy D.Va. D.Va's defense matrix can be very, very powerful. The fact is, she's able to absorb a lot of damage. But there are two heroes that are able to get by that defense matrix with their main weapon very consistently. Zarya and Mei. Mei in particular is very effective against D.Va because she can get around the defense matrix with her weapon as well as able to slow down D.Va, possibly freezing her before she dashes off. Zarya on the meanwhile is able to do some damage, but she's not able to chase a running D.Va. Now you may be saying to yourself, Dragnix, why don't you just go another hero that counters? Well, that is a solution, but what about Mei herself and the people who were choosing Mei without realizing she was broken, especially in the competitive scene? Before getting into a match, there was no in-game information that Mei was broken. The fact is, if you went into a competitive game without looking at Reddit, without looking at the forums, you would have had no idea that Mei was broken until you got in and realized, oh wait, I can't slow anybody down. I can't freeze anybody. Oh crap, my team is screwed. See, that's the kind of information and feature set you put into the game to deal with these situations. Again, you are never gonna have a bugless game. It's just not possible. And no matter how much QA you put into it, there's always gonna be a little problem that shines through. So you put in features to deal with those situations. For example, disabling the hero and sending a message that, hey, this hero is disabled for a time, we understand that this is causing problems, but we wanna make sure the balance of the game is kept. Now, what's odd about that solution is that the last part, the actual disabling of the hero, actually exists in Overwatch. Now, how do I know this? Well, the patch that fixed May sorta of broke something else. It broke D.Va. And this was a level one issue in Blizzard's mind. How do I know this? Well, the fact is they disabled D.Va for a period of time. Now, the reason why they disabled her was pretty simple. She was able to cause crashes in certain competitive games. And yes, that is a huge issue. So thus, you needed to fix it right away. But let's step back a second from what I've said so far. I've said that May is a level one severity issue and D.Va is definitely a level one severity issue. So hold on a second, the D.Va one seems a lot more important than the May one. And yes, that's the case. But that's the thing, even though you do prioritize things based on severity, you can prioritize issues within severity. So for example, the D.Va issue, yeah, that's a huge bug, that is a major problem, and it would go ahead of the May problem. But that doesn't mean you don't take care of the May problem right away if both problems were happening at once. This is why you have multiple developers on a team like this, or at least multiple development team groups. One group looks at one portion, one group looks at the other portion, because they're both really big issues. Yes, maybe you don't have the expertise in that certain amount of code, but guess what? It is this important of an issue that you go outside your comfort zone. The thing is, is that Overwatch is not the only game that is experiencing this. For example, GTA 5, GTA Online, recently had a change that completely took out the register clerks within the game, which is pretty important considering you can't even complete the tutorial unless a register clerk is there. So that actually broke the game for several people. 
Is it just me, or is this becoming a recent trend in the last couple of years? Yes, the issues existed in 2010 and 2008 with games like TF2, but the issues in question didn't seem to break the game like we've seen over the last couple of years. Games like Overwatch, games like Grand Theft Auto V, games like The Division. So is it the fact that the code has become that much more complicated, that the games have become more complicated, and thus we have more bugs? Is it the QA process and it needing an evolution of sorts? Well, I don't think it's any of that actually. At the core of what I think the problem is, is the marketing teams behind these games as well as the upper management of the games. In other words, they're the ones who are pushing the decision to make these releases even though they're not done. Note the examples that I talked about in this video. The Division, Team Fortress 2, Overwatch, Grand Theft Auto Online. What do they all have in common? Well, they have significant updates over the years, but several of those updates also had monetization as a part of them. Several years ago when the free-to-play model and the types of cosmetics that you see nowadays wasn't as prevalent, the updates in question, yeah, they could probably wait a turn. Yeah, you wanted to get an update out to the followers of your game, but the thing was, there wasn't any other factors pushing you to it. You could make quality the first thing in your mind. The Uprising event is the prime example of this. They put marketing money into making a trailer to bring back older players that may have put down the game, or to get more people interested in the new skins, which is another revenue source. There are a lot of factors that go into the decision to make a release, but when it comes to money and when it comes to a company, it's usually gonna go that route first, regardless of the quality or the kinds of problems that a new release can make. Complicating this is the fact that you already have a fan base there that's looking for new content in most cases. Yes, there is new content. Yes, there is new skins. A lot of people are going to be excited and they're going to overlook major problems with the game. Meanwhile, people who like, let's say, May players who really wanted to get into this new update, well, guess what? They're sort of screwed. And it's really tricky in this case to get a real read on the community on the issues in question. Again, you just release new content, and a lot of people, regardless of the quality of that content, are really going to enjoy it, at least for the first hour or so. It's something new, it's something different, it's something they've been waiting for, especially to the fact that it is a new game mode with Overwatch Uprising. Yeah, there are people angry that May is broken. There are people who aren't angry that May is broken because, well, May is bullshit in their eyes. But those people who are angry, yeah, they're yelling. They are screaming at the forums. But they're also getting drowned out a little bit by the people who are appreciating the game. And thus you have this dilemma. You pushed out a release that several people enjoy, but several people don't. Which one is true? Which one is the right decision in terms of the release process? And then there's the other problem. If you were to say wait for that release and wait until it was done fully, tested everything, tested every little nook and cranny, the thing is, people may leave your game. And that's a huge problem, especially for a game like Overwatch. Unfortunately, we live in an ADD society right now. And this is coming from somebody with OCD, ADHD. People will drop your game and go to the next one very, very quickly. So you have to do something. You have to keep their attention. And so these releases are important. But you would hope that you would take the time to make sure that you are up to quality for the original release of the game. In Blizzard's case, they definitely have not been with several of their last releases. You would hope they would have a high quality standard. But the standards they've been slipping with Blizzard lately especially in Overwatch. Yes, I understand they brought out some new skins and they're pretty and the gameplay is still good. But if you look at the little details, the things that they've broken on very simple updates, again, there was nothing in this update that suggested that May should have been affected in terms of her slowness. No new abilities, no gameplay changes to May, just her pinky finger. So apparently her pinky finger was the source of her power or you made a change that wasn't in the release notes that significantly affected the game. It's all complicated by the fact that you've got people and their voices being heard more than ever before. 
Again, you guys are watching this video hearing me talk about these issues in question. But I'm only one of, let's say, one million people that are talking about it on the internet, talking about on forums, talking about the whole situation with Overwatch as a whole. And that discussion, all those voices all crying out at once, may not necessarily help the severity issue that I brought up before. Again, we knew that the D.Va issue and the May issue are level 1 severities, or at least in my mind. But do you remember back to the Chinese New Year? What was the biggest bug that came out of that release? Well, it was May and her waist. Think about what I said earlier. That would be a level 5 bug. The thing is, it's cosmetic. Yeah, it looks a little bit awkward to look at, but when it comes to the actual gameplay, it doesn't affect that much. You can still play the game and enjoy the game, even though things look a little bit off. But what happened? Well, it got a social element to it. Yes, it is a cosmetic bug, but people started talking about fat acceptance, whether or not Mei was fat, whether or not it was a good thing or a bad thing, that they were trying to erase the character. And a level 5 bug, a cosmetic bug, became one of the biggest problems in Overwatch at that moment because people started talking about it. Think about that. A cosmetic bug, a bug that really doesn't affect the main product of the game in terms of the gameplay, became a bigger issue than what May was in the last Overwatch Uprising event. It became such an issue that Blizzard had to take care of it right away. But with May, they didn't have to because not many people were yelling and screaming at the top of their lungs. Unfortunately, one of the major factors when it comes to the lack of quality, at least in my opinion, is the gaming community as a whole. Unfortunately, the major sites, the bigger voices in the community, will talk about issues that really have nothing to do with the core concept of the game. But because it's popular, because people are going to talk about issues that they're going to get invested in, then it becomes a major issue for the game because that's what the discussion about the game is centered around. Look, I've talked a lot in this episode and I want to hear what you guys think. I'm going to try to do that follow-up format that I did for the Persona 5 series. And I'll probably put a game in there that isn't Overwatch in terms of the follow-up to give you guys something a little bit different. But I want to hear what you think. I put a lot of ideas out there and there's a lot of discussion to be had. So what do you think about the quality control of Blizzard? What do you think is the major problem regarding quality in modern AAA gaming? Anyway, this is Dragnik signing out, and I hope you guys enjoyed this discussion and this video. Again, I will probably follow up with another video talking about your comments and talking about some of the things that you guys had to say. But until then, I will see you all later. And as always, keep on gaming.